Okay, this is going to be the first introduction to the Closer Reading channel. And uh, there are two parts to this. And the first is that I'll be reading or uh, just kind of going through uh, work exactly as it's written. And this is going to be the one of the first videos where we're talking about specifically a companion to that, which is going through it, but talking about it not focusing just on the work itself. So I've read this book, um, well, I've read this chapter of this book several times, and uh, I've read the book at least twice by now, but it's it's very, very good. Uh, Mason and Dixon by Thomas Pynchon. And uh, I'm just going to go through the first chapter. We'll see how far we get and uh, try and examine it and see how many of these uh, different things throughout uh, I can notice as I've read a couple of Pynchon's other books and you know some of this is just going to be guesses but um, basically this is for people who really like the works whether whether it be a, a book a poem or a song whatever it is and uh, who want to learn a little bit more about it but haven't um, you know maybe have difficulty understanding and um, trying to learn and examine as much as they can to, to figure out what, you know, what's, what's going on as well as we can. So this is chapter one, oh, section one of Mason and Dixon, Latitudes and Departures, chapter one. Snowballs have flown their arcs. So from that first, from those first four, five, six words, we're talking already um, arcs. That's a very, very big part of the story because anyone who knows just from the title, it's called Mason and Dixon. The Mason Dixon line is uh, actually two lines that run through uh, that divide Pennsylvania and Maryland and uh, part of Virginia as well and, and Delaware. So the fact snowballs have flown their arcs, what they're doing is taking a map of the planet, which is incorrect. Anytime one looking at a map is not looking at uh, what actually is because the earth is circular. So what they're doing is using the stars to map and figure out um, what this line actually means and where it leads and what it is. And it's basically, uh, God, I think it's, I think it's six or eight feet um, the width of it. And then it's just directly west is the west line. And so that that first idea arcs is going to be used over and over again because you're actually even though they're going directly west it's it's a much uh more complicated thing snowballs have flown their arcs starred the sides of outbuildings stars is probably the main idea of this uh of this story it's constantly you know the two characters are uh astronomers mason more than dixon but both of them are uh, the first thing they do together is uh, watch the transit of Venus, which is the planet Venus crossing across the uh, surface of the sun. And we'll talk more about that as that chapter. I think that's chapter 10. Um, as we get into that, starred the sides of outbuildings as of cousins carried hats away into the brisk wind off Delaware. So he's, they're talking about snowballs. They're, they're, it's kids having fun. They're, they're, they're playing, they're, they're throwing snowballs at each other. They're, they're hitting buildings and they're hitting, um, they're hitting each other. And uh, carried hats away, basically, they're, they're, they're you know, they're knocking uh, somebody's hat <laughs> A couple of people's hats are getting knocked off and they're getting blown across. And you get the first idea of what this is, is that these kids are playing in Philadelphia and the wind 
is coming in from Delaware. So the first, I don't know, what, what are we, 20 words in, we've got a, an indication of a boundary line. So they're playing on the boundary line that was created as a result of uh, the story of um, the sleds are brought in and their runners carefully dried and greased. Shoes deposited in the back hall. A stocking foot descent made upon the great kitchen in a purposeful dither since morning, punctuated by the ringing lids of various boilers and stewing pots, fragrant with pied spices, peeled fruits, suet, heated sugar. The children, having all upon the fly, among rhythmic slaps of batter and spoon, coaxed and stolen what they might. Proceed as upon each afternoon, all this snowy advent to a comfortable room at the rear of the house, years since given over to their carefree assaults. That is the end of the first sentence. It's almost half the page. That's going to happen a lot. It's this book functions as a a poem and a play and a novel. The goal of it is to create a stage in your mind to witness all of these things happening. Also, one thing I just want to mention, um, the repetition of uh, sounds that you'll hear, um, the ending of uh, certain ideas um, that are sometimes capitalized, sometimes it's, it's much more, even more fluid than that. But it's not an end of a sentence. It's not... Um, you just listen to it and you can hear the, the sounds of it. And the, what I'm talking about is um, when they say having all upon the fly among rhythmic slaps of batter and spoon coaxed and stolen what they might as upon each afternoon. So spoon afternoon, all this snowy advent to a comfortable room of the rear of the house, your sense given over to their carefree assault. he's going to use language constantly constructing and deconstructing sounds to hear it as you would hear in the best possible poetry you could find really trying to test the limits and push the boundaries of what um, language can do. And he's doing this not consciously, I would imagine, because that would, I mean, he, he could be, I guess, but, what I'm getting and what I get from Pynchon's other books, like Gravity's Rainbow and Crying of Lot 49, is just a person who's using their gift. And their gift might be the best we've seen so far in terms of um, in terms of using poetry in new ways that are uh, just like I already said. They're, they're really pushing the boundary of what genius can do. So he's just trusting his gift and creating these uh, vivid, vivid images, and they're they're great. You know, like we're you've got kids coming in out of the snow. They're uh, you know the, the great kitchen. They've got all these kinds of things going on. There's uh, some kind of party. Um, he tells us that it's Advent, so it's around the Christmas season. Like, we're getting to a really, really cozy place with all of these ideas. Um, and we'll just continue. You'll see. Here have come to rest a long, scarred sawbuck table with two mismatched side benches from the Lancaster County branch of the family. Some Second Street Chippendale, including an interpretation of the famed Chinese sofa, with a high canopy of yards of purple stuff that might be drawn all round to make a snug, dim tent. Another idea, just coziness. We're, we're coming in out of the elements and we're going to share a story together. We're going to share a, a, a community and a moment that will be um, a symbol for what Philadelphia and the founding of the United States is for the entire country. But deeper than that, of just sharing 
language and human communication as a way to uh, create community. Snug dim tent. A few odd chairs sent from England before the war. So now we've got two other, uh, you know, he's saying the Lancaster County branch of the family. There's another division. A few odd chairs sent from England before the war. Another division. Mostly pine and cherry about, nor much mahogany, excepting a sinister and wonderful card table, which exhibits the cheaper wave-like grain known in the trade as wandering heart causing an illusion of depth into which for years children have gazed as into the illustrated pages of books. So a common theme in uh, a lot of different works like this um, is to sh offer a painting in the beginning. Um, and this one I'm going to tell you is going to offer a couple, but this is the first that I can tell is this um Sinister, wonderful card table with the uh, the varnish or whatever it is on the wood that's causing these images that um, kids can just look into and start seeing more and more things. That's what the book is going to be. And it's going to be, we're the kids, we're anyone reading the book, enjoying the story, is going to be able to find meaning and meaning and meaning again and again and again, more and more stuff. So... Obviously, I'm not explaining this book to anyone. This is just me saying out loud what I'm seeing and discovering on this occasion when I'm reading it. Tomorrow reading it, I might see more, I might see less, I might see something completely different. But this is what I'm seeing right now. Where were we? Um, along, so he's talking about uh, the card table. With, along with so many hinges, sliding mortises, hidden catches, and secret compartments that neither the twins nor their sister can say they have been to the end of it. Again, that is what he's doing. That's why um, he's not just telling you a story of, this is, was Mason and Dixon. This is what they did. Even that would be great. It would be really interesting, and there's enough content here to make that book. But this is not the book he's writing. The book he's writing is a book that has infinite depth to it. It will be constantly changed. It's meant to be reread and reread and reread forever. He's trying to compete, not saying consciously, maybe not, maybe so, with Hamlet, with uh, Moby Dick, with Paradise Lost, with um, Homer's Iliad, these things that will constantly be reread over and over and over again and is a testament to the artist's gift, which is really um, uh, the gift for art that reality grants us. When art could potentially not be a thing or it could be in any way weaker, that's what this genius is, uh, this, this work of genius is offering society. Upon the wall, okay, so we're gonna get another painting. Uh, Upon the wall banished to this den of parlor apes for its remembrance of a time better forgotten, reflecting most of the room. So that's that's a great that's a great line that this den of parlor apes, and that's basically with the twins, uh, Pitt and Pliny, and uh, their sister Tenebrae, and uh, the storyteller who we're going to meet in a second. Um. The carpet, this is what he's saying, reflecting most of the room. So we don't know exactly what it is yet, but it's a mirror. Um, and this is what we're seeing in the mirror. The carpets, the carpet and drapes a little frayed. Whiskers the cat, stalking beneath the furniture, looking out with eyes finely reflexive to anything suggesting food. Again, we get another allusion to what we are. The person who's reading this book, who's, um, you know, really going all in and going to be, you know, loving it. That's what we're going to be getting is, is that we're looking for these little um, kind of uh, meaning, you know, these little snaps of beauty that we're going to be getting over and over again. And that's what people reading this kind of poetry are um, going for. Oh my God. Sorry. Cat just jumped on my lips, scared the hell out of me. <laughs> Hangs a mirror in an inscribed frame commemorating the Miss Gianza, 
that memorable farewell ball staged in 77 by the British who'd been occupying the city just before their withdrawal from Philadelphia. So it's a mirror that they're ashamed of. Um, and it's also um, a uh, kind of reflection on what this uh, household is like, that this household is um, in two countries because it's right on the border. And Philadelphia is the boundary line between Maryland and Pennsylvania. It's also uh, the country of Great Britain. This, this family has a lot of ties. Um, we mentioned the chairs that were sent from England before the war. And we've got this painting that was, um, you know, a, a very large, you know, very fancy mirror that was um, this family got in 77 while the British were occupying the city. It was a farewell ball, you know, a little unknown piece of history um, that in 1776, when the American Revolution started, the British, you know, took control of Philadelphia and didn't leave until sometime in 77 or later. And, um, you know, basically we're getting this idea of, again, this is a, a, a division and a boundary line. The biggest division and boundary line we're going to get is um, that's going to be used again through, throughout is the division between the world of the living and the world of the dead. More on that later. Love these images. This Christmas tide of 1786, with the war settled and the nation bickering itself into fragments. Wounds, bodily and ghostly, great and small, go aching on. Not everyone commemorated, nor too often even recounted. Snow lies upon all Philadelphia, from river to river, whose further shores have so vanished behind curtains of ice fog that the city today might be an isle upon an ocean. Ponds and creeks are frozen over, and the trees aglare to the last slightest twig, nerve lines of concentrated light. So that's a beautiful image too, the, the, the naked trees, the snow on it reflecting in the uh, dimming sunlight. He's saying it's nerve lines of concentrated light. Hammers and saws have fallen still. Bricks lie in snow-covered heaps. City sparrows in speckled outbursts. Hop in and out of what shelter there may be. So again, this is back in the elements. This is uh, not what we're experiencing as you know, people who are going to enjoy this cozy story together, you know, with all these, uh, um, you know, all these effects from the great kitchen. The nightward sky, clouds blown to chalk smears, stretches above the Northern Liberties, Spring Garden and Germantown, its early moon pale as the snow drifts, Smoke ascends from chimney parts, chimney pots, sledging parties adjourn indoors, taverns bustle, freshly infused coffee flows every place, borne about through rooms, front and back, whilst Madeira, which has ever fueled association in these parts, is deployed nowadays like an ancient elixir upon the seething pot of politics. For the times are as impossible to calculate this advent as the distance to a star. It has become an afternoon habit for the twins and their sister and what friends old and young may find their way here to gather for another tale from their far-traveled uncle, the Reverend Wicks Cherry Coke, who arrived here back in October for the funeral of a friend of years ago. Too late for the burial, as it proved. Just that little line, too late for the burial. You don't realize how 
tragic that is, you know, like you, um, but um, we'll find out in a little while. It's, it's Mason's, Charles Mason's funeral, um, which he came back to Philadelphia for and missed it, unfortunately. And uh, the more and more you meet Wicks and understand what importance uh, connection and the love he has of other people's lives, you realize how how uh, painful that that the fact that he was too late for it uh, is is for him, um, and has lingered as a guest in the house of his sister Elizabeth, the wife of many years of Mr. J. Wade Lespark, a respected merchant, active in town affairs, whilst in his home, yet sultan enough to convey to the reverend, though without ever so stipulating that for as long as he can keep the children amused, he may remain. Too much evidence of juvenile rampage at the wrong moment, however, and Babo will be out the door with him, where awaits the winter's block and blade. So again, we have two people who are very, very different. Um, Le Spark, whose home this is, they're his children, uh, Pitt, Pliny, and Tenebrae. Um, and the Reverend, who's going to be the one telling us the story, uh, Wicks Cherry Coke. Um, no idea he's named Cherry Coke, uh, but Pynchon has another character in another book named Cherry Coke, I'm sure. And uh, I, he must just like the name. It's... Uh, um, but the he's he's a reverend and his name is Wix and if you notice the other guy's name is uh, Mr. J. Wade LaSpark so you've got a Wick and you've got a Spark and basically the Wick is going to be the storyteller and the Spark is the um, like I keep saying the idea just keeps coming up to me the time I'm reading it is the shelter from the elements the Spark is um, is is the home of what makes this all possible you know and that is also a division. And the more we learn about the spark, we're going to realize how much, how meaningful that is, um, because he is a uh, he's a merchant, but he's also uh, he's he sold weapons in the French and Indian War. He probably sold weapons in the uh, the Cresset War between Maryland and Pennsylvania, and he sold weapons in the American Revolution. So. Um, he probably sold weapons to the British and he probably sold weapons to the Americans. So we've got, um, this person and that's, you know, people reading this cause this book was published in 97. People reading this understand that like, that's kind of the position of, uh, America and the moneyed interests of, um, all across the world is this profiting off, uh, you know, military action of others, you know? And in a lot of cases, selling arms to both sides. But not to get too far off topic. Um, so again, the winter's block and blade. That's another reference to what we were talking about before is that we've... Uh, and he's saying, again, that the rev, as long as he can keep the children amused. So as long as basically they, they can be fed their, their entertainment... Um, you know, all the things that, that we're looking for, as long as that keeps coming, he's allowed to stay. But once um, things start getting out of hand, you know, once the kids start going crazy again, you're out. Thus, they have heard the escape from Hottentot land, the accursed ruby of Magok, the shipwrecks in Indies east and west, a Herodotic web of adventures and curiosities selected the reverend implies for their moral usefulness, whilst avoiding others not as suitable in the hearing of youth. The youth, as usual, not being consulted in this. Tenebrae has seated herself and taken up her needlework, a piece whose size and difficulty are already subjects of discussion in the house, the embroideress herself keeping silence upon this topic at least. Announced by nasal telegraph, in come the twins bearing the old pewter coffee machine venting its puffs of vapor and a large basket dedicated to saccharomanic appetites piled to the brim with fresh fried donuts rolled in sugar glazed chestnuts buns fritters crullers tarts what's this why lad why lads you've read my mind 
The coffee's for you, Unc. Last time you were talking in your sleep, the pair explained, placing the sweets near themselves, all in this room being left to seize and pour as they may. So, again, you know, everybody else, and it's not just the, we're going to see a lot, there's actually a lot of people listening to this story. It's not just the twins and their sister. Um, what would they say? Oh, uh, friends old and young, um, but their cousins there, their uncles. Um, they, uh, I, even the spark and his wife are there as well. And, uh, he's again, he's the sister. Uh, so the, this is his brother-in-law's house. Um, but Wix's other sister is there too. Uh, Aunt Euphrenia, who's another great character, but all the characters in the story are great. Totally vivid, um, totally realized um, uh, imaginations. It's, it's, it's really terrific. As none could agree which had been born first, the twins were named Pitt and Pliny, so that each might be termed the elder or the younger, as might day-to-day -day please one or annoy his brother. Why haven't we heard a tale about America? Pitt licking gobbets of Philadelphia pudding from his best jabot with Indians in it and Frenchmen, adds Pliny, whose least gesture sends cookie crumbs everywhere. So we've got, you know, same idea. We've heard that the cat is looking out for food and we've just heard that the cookie crumbs are getting sent everywhere. So while this story is going on, you can... You, you use your imagination and you realize that the cat is running around, you know, like the, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of life going on in this room, you know, in, in the way we've got a stage, which is the, um, the story being told, but the stage within that is also another story. You know, the, the family listening to the story is its own, um, it has its, has its own play to it as well. And, um, that's probably the same kind of idea that Shakespeare has, that um, all the world is a stage and we're players upon it. Um, but yeah, that, that, uh, that, that story is, is still being told. French women come to that murder's pit. It's not easy being pious for both of us, you know, plenty advises. This is how the story starts. It's 20 years, recalls the Rev, since we all topped the Allegheny Ridge together and stood looking out at the Ohio country, so fair, a revelation meadowed to the horizon. Mason and Dixon and all the McLeans, Darby and Coat. No, Darby wouldn't have been there in 66, howbeit. Old Mr. Barnes and young Tom Hines, the rascal. Don't know where they all went. Some fought in the war, and some chose peace, come what might. Some profited. Some lost everything. Some are gone to Kentucky, and some, as now, poor Mason, to dust. It was not too many years before the war. What we were doing out in that country together was brave, scientific beyond my understanding, and ultimately meaningless. We were putting a line straight through the heart of the wilderness, eight yards wide and due west, in order to separate two proprietorships granted when the world was yet feudal, and but eight years later to be nullified by the war for independence. And now Mason's gone, and the Reverend Cherry Coke, who came to town only to pay his respects, has lingered through the first descent of cold, the first drawings in to the hearth side, the first harvest season meals appearing upon the next best dishes. He had intended to be gone weeks ago, but finds he cannot detach. Each day among his devoirs is a visit, however brief, to Mason's grave. The verger has taken to nodding at him. In the middle of the night, recently he awoke convinced that twas he who had been haunting Mason, that like a shade with a grievance, he expected Mason, but newly arrived at death to help him with something.
After years wasted, the reverend commences at perfecting a parsonical disguise, grown old in the service of an, of an impersonation that never took more than a handful of actors' tricks, past remembering those yearnings for danger, past all that ought to have been, but never had a hope of becoming, have I beached upon these Republican shores, stoven, dismasted, imbecile with age, an untrustworthy remembrancer, for whom the few events yet rattling within a broken memory must provide the only comfort now remaining to him. So this isn't just dialogue. This is a person in front of an audience. And all of the dialogue in this story and all of the text has that same effect. It is, like I said before, it's a stage in your mind when you're reading it. And it's meant to be read out loud because the sounds are more beautiful that way. Uncle, Tenebrae pretends to gasp. And but this morning, you look so much younger. Why, I had no idea. Kindly, Bray. That is from my secret revelation, of course. I didn't know that I'd phrase it quite like this, that in the present company. Then Tenenbrae, replying to her uncle's twinkling with the usual play of eyelashes. It begins with a hanging. <laughs> Excellent, cry the twins. The reverend, producing a scarred old notebook covered in cheap leather, begins to read. Had I been the first churchman of modern times to be swung from the Tyburn tree, had I been then taken for dead, whilst in fact but spending an intermission among the eventless corridors of syncope due to the final bowl of ale, had a riotous throng of medical students taken what they deemed to be my cadaver back beneath the somber groins of their college, had I then been resurrected into an entirely new knowledge of the terms of being in which our savior, strange to say, in that era of Wesley and Whitefield, though present, would not have figured as preeminently as with most sectarians, howbeit, I should closely resemble the nomadic parson you behold today. Mother says you're the family outcast, Pitt remarks. They pay you money to keep you away, says Pliny. Your grandsire Cherry Coke, lads, has ever kept his promise to remit to me by way of certain chartered companies, a sum precise to the farthing and punctual as the moon to any address in the world, save one in Britain. Britain is his world, and he will persist even now in standing shamed before it for certain crimes of my distant youth. Crimes, explained the boys together. Why, so did wicked men declare him. Before God, another tale. What'd they nail you on? Uncle Ives wishes to know. Strictly professional interest, of course. Green brief bag over one shoulder. But lately returned from a coffee house meeting, he is bound later this evening for a nightly, more formal version of the same thing. Feeling here with the children, much as might a coaching passenger, let off at nightfall among an unknown populace to wait for a connecting coach alone, pedestrian, desiring to pass the time to some revenue, if not profit. So the first thing this character, Uncle Ives, is what they nail you on, strictly professional interest, of course. So the guy's a criminal. Um, and then you also say you've got a green brief bag, which um, to me, that means, you know, that's a money bag, you know, with the with a dollar sign on it. You know, it's just that it's meant to bring that kind of association into your mind. And again, we get this idea of a person who's a coaching passenger, a pedestrian, just kind of a, a, a lonely person who's getting shelter from this. You know, again, any one reader who picks up this book and starts reading it is going to get that same thing. A stranger to the characters, a stranger to the story, but drawn in to this cozy hearthside to um, 
you know, witness this, this art with us. Along with some lesser counts, the reverend is replying, "'Twas one of the least tolerable offenses in that era, the worst of Dick Turpin, seeming but the carelessness of youth beside it, the crime they styled anonymity. That is, I left messages posted publicly, but did not sign them. I knew some night running lads in the district who let me use their printing press. Somehow, what I got into printing up were accounts of certain crimes I had observed committed by the stronger against the weaker. Enclosures, evictions, assays verdicts, activities of the military, giving the names of as many as the perpetrators as I was sure of, yet keeping back what I foolishly imagined my own. Till the night I was tipped and brought into London in chains and clapped in the tower. The tower! Oh, do not tease them so, Tenebrae Prison. Ludgate then, whichever, twas gall. It took me till I was lying among the rats and vermin upon the freezing edge of a future invisible to understand that my name had never been my own, rather belonging all this time to the authorities who forbade me to change it or withhold it as twere a ring upon the collar of a beast ever waiting for the lead to be fastened on. One of those moments Hindus and Chinamen are ever said to be having entire loss of self, perfect union with all sort of thing. Strange lights, fires, voices indecipherable, children, indeed children. This is the part of the tale where your old uncle gets to go insane. Or so then, each in his interest, did it please everyone to style me. Sea voyages in those days being the standard treatment for insanity. My exile should commence for the best of medical reasons. Though my inclination had been to go aboard an East Indiaman, the reverend continues, as that route east traversed notoriously a lively and youthful world of shipboard dalliance, gale force assemblies and duels ashore with the French fleet a constant. For some romantic danger, like pirates yet more polite, as the lady has often assured me. Alas, those who controlled my fate, getting wind of my preference at the last moment, swiftly arranged to have me transferred into a small British frigate sailing alone. Upon a long voyage in a time of war, the seahorse, 24 guns, Captain Smith. I hastened into Leadenhall to inquire. Can this be objection, we hear, I was greeted? Are you saying that a sixth rate is beneath you? Would you prefer to remain ashore and take up quarters in Bedlam? It was made, it has made a man of many in your situation. Some have come to enjoy fairly meaningful lives there. Or if it's some need for the exotic, we might arrange for a stay in one of the French hospitals. Would one of my condition even know how to object, my lord? I owe you everything. Madness has not impaired your memory. Good. Keep away from harmful substances, in particular coffee, tobacco, and Indian hemp. If you must use the latter, do not inhale. Keep your memory working, young man. Have a safe voyage. Must be his uh, his uncle who's been sending him money uh, every month for his entire life. I don't think we get any more out of him, but you know, just that dialogue. We don't even know specifically who that was, but it's so vivid. You know, it's so uh, you know you 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 get the character at every turn, at every word. You you're getting this you know really vivid encounter. And this is the end of chapter one. So, with this no doubt well-meant advice, finding its way into the mid-watch, sounds of waves past my sleeping place, I set sail upon an engine of destruction in the hope that eastward yet might dwell something of peace and godhead. 
which British civilization, in venturing westward, had left behind. So the main part of the story is the West Line, the line that will divide Pennsylvania and Maryland. And we're getting this idea that we found something. Um, we found peace and, and Godhead, and we're going to be leaving that behind in our venture west um, in America. But he's just talking about Britain right now, but that'll be the, that'll be the story. And thus was my consternation the least of my feelings when instead of supernatural guidance from Lama's oldest time, here came Jean Krapada looming, 34 guns worth of disaster, and only one lesson. All right, it's the end of chapter one.